I was blind, but now I see. Praise God, 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 praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. If you stand with me, please. I want to give honor to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to thank God for what he's doing and what he's going to do. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Asking the Lord to be with this minister to bring forth a portion of word this morning that we can hide in our hearts and use it to further our walk in the Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray this prayer. Everyone say amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right. I want to talk just for a minute about a word called attitude. Attitude. Turn around to someone and say attitude. The longer that I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life and what we do. It's so important than the past, than education, even money. More important than circumstances, more important than failures, more important than successes, than what other people or what other people might think or say. It's more important. It's more important than anything, no matter what somebody says about you. Are you getting this message? No matter how, it's not what they say, it's how you handle it. The attitude part of it. It's more important than appearance. The attitude is more important than appearance. The attitude, or even no matter how much you're gifted, or how much your skill, the attitude, the attitude will break a company. The attitude will break a church. The attitude will break a home. The attitude will break a friend. Are you with me this morning? Glory to God. Hallelujah. My daddy used to say, put your mind in gear before you start your tongue flapping. That's very important. So as many times we say something that maybe we wish we hadn't have said. If we just had thought one more second, maybe we wouldn't have said it. Maybe sometimes we need to be quiet and consider the source. The remarkable thing is that we have a choice every day of our lives regarding the attitude that we are going to embrace for that whole day. The attitude that we're going to have that whole day. We could come in the presence of another person. We could get up of a morning with an attitude. That attitude could be a good attitude. With a smile on your face. Or it could be a bad attitude with a grouch on your face. Come on, church. 
Glory to God. It could be an attitude. Honey, I made the coffee. So what? <laughs> so what? Well, thank you, dear. How did you like your biscuits? Man, they were lousy. Is that the best you could do? No more biscuits. Come on, church. Be careful what you say because somebody, you might be hurting their feelings. Think about it before you say it. Put your mind in gear before you start your tongue flapping. Most times it'll come out different then. <clears throat> we can't change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the environment. We can't change that. The only thing we can do is play on the one string that we have, church, and that is our attitude. We can, we can play on our attitude. We can praise God. We can change a lot of people. We can change a lot of everything, the atmosphere and everything else with our attitude. Come on, church. Oh, God, hallelujah. I talked about it one time before because someone talked about in an airplane, they have a meter. And that meter has a name, altitude meter, where it determines how up it's going or how down it's going. And they didn't call it altitude. They nicknamed it attitude meter. Your attitude determines how high you're going to rise or how low you're going to rise. Come on, church. We need to watch our attitudes, our attitudes to each other, our attitudes in our presence, our attitudes in how we present ourselves. Can someone say praise the Lord? The only thing we can do is, 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 is remember we can't change the end of animal, but we can change our attitude. Amen. God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Amen. And that, so it is with you too. We are in charge of our attitudes. We are in charge of how we, we react and how, what we do. And now let me tell you, the devil thinks he's in charge. But the devil's a liar and the father of lies. Someone say praise the Lord. <laughs> I don't always feel good. You don't always feel good. Sometimes we feel bad. But we don't have to be grouchy about it. Can someone say praise the Lord? We don't have to be grouchy about it. Because we know someone that's greater than that. His name is Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to talk a little bit this morning about someone in, in the Bible that has an attitude, that had an attitude. I want you to turn with me to Jonah. Uh-oh. Right away it clicked, didn't it? Praise God. Over to Jonah. We're going to preach out of there this morning. So this man had an attitude. Jesus confirmed the authenticity of Jonah. Let's read ch chapter 1, if you will, verses 1, 2, and 3. If you got to say amen. I better call Carl, come on in. How's your mother? Not too much. Keep Carl's mother in prayer. She's in the hospital. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. The son of Amittah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fire thereof, and he went down into it. 
to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You talk about a man with an attitude in disobedience. Here was one. Now, Jesus confirmed the reality of Jonah, but yet it is the most ridiculous, ridiculed book of all books in the Old Testament by the liberals and the modernists, and they poke fun at such a fish swallowing a whole man. But yet that man not only lived in the belly of the fish, but he survived to preach God's word again. Amen. They laugh at Jonah and the whale. Well, it didn't necessarily have to be a whale, but he prepared a fish big as a whale to swallow him. The truth is, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. That right turn verse 17, first chapter. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Glory to God. Hallelujah. See, God can make any type of fish he wants to. He don't make no difference what size. He can make any size he wants to. He can make a he can he can take a, a minnow and make a wheel out of it if he wants to. Come on, anybody, anybody can take a, a couple of small fishes and a little bit of bread and feed thousands and thousands of people out of it. He certainly can make a fish big enough from a little one to a big one or whatever he wants to do. <laughs> God can make any type of fish. However, the real value of the book is God's care for lost and suffering humanity. So he sent his rebellious prophet with this bad attitude. He preached to, sent him to preach his word to, to them so, so that they acted on the evidence of that word, could hear the word and have faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Further, this book is assurance to us that the words of God spoken by an agent of God still have power to cause a person and a people to repent and be saved. Further, as Abraham's faith went beyond himself, so Jonah, after his, uh, this experience in the belly of the great fish, saw his faith go beyond his previous limited vision to missionary work to those regions beyond. You know, we have burdens. Many times I have started to pray, my wife and I, Many times I've prayed by myself. Many times she prayed by herself. And I'm sure you have too. And I'm sure that whenever you're praying, that all of a sudden that God lays somebody or something on your heart. Come on, church. A lot of people get kind of carried away. And they think that God is trying to get them to go out there and be a missionary or a preacher or blah, blah, blah. When really he wants you to pray for them people prayers see God said go 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 you must say I can't go I'm too old to go I don't have the money to go you can go with your prayers glory to God hallelujah you can go with your prayers for that person glory to God because there's power in your prayer if you believe Amen. in the Lord yeah. and walking in obedience to him and with the right attitude can someone say praise the Lord Glory to God. Just as in Jonah, Christ is God's great missionary. So we, we who look at Jonah, we are taught that we also must go where the Lord sends us with his word of deliverance. Come on, church. Jonah finally obeyed God in a fish and could no longer contain him. Obedience breaks the yoke. Uh, so made that fish stick too. <laughs> he decided he didn't want no more. Come on, church. He, at least though he, he got to the shore before he lost his baggage. I'll put it that way. He was successful at a lost and suffering Nineveh, but still couldn't understand. Now, listen, listen, listen to this prophet. Listen to this, praise God, Jonah. He sent him there, but he couldn't understand God being such a merciful or good God. He couldn't understand it. His experience under the gourd vine talks about in chapter 4, verse 5 through 11. And I'm not going to go there right now, but you mark that down in chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. Just praise God. Hallelujah. It's one of the most touching scenes in which we see God's nature is always curing, always saving, always healing. I, I don't know about you. I've been a Jonah from time to time. I've been in that, I've been in that category. 
Glory to God. You don't have to stay there, though. When you get to be a Christian, you don't have to stay there. Glory to God. Sometimes uh, back whenever I got saved, I kind of doubted that I'd be received. But also, like Jonah, I've seen great, great many people set free by the power of God working through our ministries. Glory to God. I want you to read Jonah when you get a chance all the way through and see yourself in the most personal way and then find a new joy in obeying God and what God would have you to do. Too many times we want to do everything on our own. And we, we just kind of just rule God right out, man. We just take him right out of the picture. Can someone say praise the Lord? But it's time that we rule him in. It's time that we begin to realize that there's something else greater. Hallelujah. And that greater is God. He is greater. He's greater than anything. Hallelujah. And greater, as it tells us in, praise God, in the first John chapter 4, verse 4, I believe it is, that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And we realize that, praise God, and walk in his time. See, time caught up with the city of Nineveh. They become very wicked. They were, they were, the wickedness had reached the highest heaven, Re reached God, hallelujah. God spoke and said that Nineveh should be destroyed within 40 days. He gave the city of Nineveh, the old most wicked city and the richest city of the earth, a time limit of 40 days in which to hear the word of God and repent. God pronounced this sentence of judgment, but he tempered it with mercy as he usually does. He tempted it with mercy. God set about to find a man with a commanding presence and a voice. And whether you know it, this, this, this man with this attitude and this disobedient nature, he had that voice. He had that voice that God wanted him to have. He had that commanding presence and voice, a man with deep feeling compassion, a man with ability that he could use, a man whom he could send to Nineveh to stand on the most prominent streets of the city, lift up that voice and shout, Yet forty days had God given Nineveh, and unless you repent, your city shall be wiped off of the face of the earth. Jonah was that man. Jonah had the voice. He had the presence. He had the passion. He had the deep feeling, the understanding. Jonah was that man. He was a man of ability that God could use. He was a man who could get the job done. So the presence and voice of God came to Jonah and said, Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and do the preaching unto them that I bid thee. But Jonah, he rose up. And he got an attitude and disobedience. Because he went down and got on a ship, paid the fire, and went in the opposite direction, man. He, was, he wasn't going to Nineveh. He was going to Tarshish. <laughs> he was really taken off. The voice of God was very clear to Jonah. Jonah felt the presence of the Lord. He knew what God wanted him to do. But he rose up and began the most famous flight in history. Jonah is a man who tried to run away from the Almighty God. It won't work. Maybe there's someone in here in this same situation today. Maybe that's why God gave me this message. One thing that God wants us to know this morning is that we got to have the right attitude. We got to be obedient. And God wants us to know if you're starting to run in another direction. How do you do that, Pastor? You start endeavoring in things of the past. You start going back to where you were. You start going to do things that's contrary to God's word, and you're just more and more getting engulfed, running from God, going in a different direction, thinking that he's not watching you and thinking that you can get away with it. He went down to the seashore, the little town of Joppa, a little south of modern Tel Aviv, then he got on a ship and went down to the bottom of it. And guess what he did when he got down to the bottom of it? He fell asleep. Uh-huh. He, 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 man, he, he just went down to the bottom of that ship and fell asleep. The ship sailed ac uh, way across the Mediterranean Sea toward the city of Tarsus, which is exactly in the opposite direction from Nineveh, where God had told jo uh, Jonah to go to. 
John will run away for the same reason that people become runaways in our time. First, John will run away because he had race prejudice. He had race prejudice, church. He was a Hebrew. The city of Nineveh was filled with Gentile people, and his Hebrew had prejudice in his heart. God is not the God of a chosen few. He's not the God of a hand-picked few. He's not, uh, uh, he's, God is just God. He's not just the God of Pastor Denison. He's the God of everyone. No matter what color, no matter what race, no matter what it is, how much you sin, God is not just for one. He's for all. He's the God of the whole world. The Apostle Paul stood in Athens, in Greeks, Greece, and he said that God made all human beings of one blood. When Jesus Christ of Nazareth died for every man, woman, and child who ever shall be born in this world, he gave his life to save every one of us. He has to, and we don't have no right to say anything against any race. We don't have any right because the love of God is for the whole world. He's got the whole world in his hand. Everybody. Everybody. The second reason I want to point out this morning why Jonah ran away was because he cared more about his reputation. Come on, church. He cared more about that than he did about God, or the Word of God. He didn't want the Lord to make a fool of him. Apostle Paul said that he was a fool for Christ's sake, didn't he? Amen. Come on, church. That he was the very offscoring of human society. See, the Apostle Paul put himself on the brink of human misery. He was misunderstood, criticized, blasphemed, whipped, shipwrecked, cursed, and kicked. His name was spoken evil of throughout the world. He was a fool for Christ, for Jesus' sake. Come on, church. There are some people who will serve God as long as there's no cross to bear. Oh, I'll serve the Lord as long as I can do whatever I want to do. You've got to take up the cross and follow Jesus Amen. daily. Amen. Glory to God. How to know, uh, oh, how to do it. And they'll serve God as long as there's no cross to bear and no criticism to take. But when you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, you're going to serve him no matter what somebody might say, no matter even if they hate you, you are still going to serve God. And you're going to thank God for that person and pray for them if they don't, if they're not exactly what you think they should be. Church, I want to say to you this morning, religion is not a neutral thing. Religion is controversial, especially when you have the power of God. Remember they killed Jesus Christ? It was religion that killed him and nailed him to the tree. Yeah. He was hung up as a fool before the world. It's unpopular with some groups to be charismatic Christian. That's the reason some people run away when God taps them on the shoulder to call or calls them. They're afraid to be laughed at, to be a fool for Christ's sake. If you've ever tasted the real power of God, you don't feel like that. If you're saved, you have the power of God in your life. It doesn't make much difference what they say. It must, don't make no, much difference what their attitude is. It don't make no difference. You just go along, no wonder, Sister Eleanor, no wonder, glory to God, you can see people that really know the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Yes. And there's all kinds of things going on around them, but because they know that they know that they know that no matter what happens to them, you can't even kill them. Come on, church. Because they're going to be alive with the Lord forever. Yes, Glory to God. And you can walk in the meanest places, do whatever you want to do. But no matter what happens to you, glory to God. The minute that your soul leaves, your body is in the arms of God. How the body got shot am I got tied? And you've got that a blessed assurance inside of you. There's nothing can pull you away. Hang in there. 
but the devil can pull you away if you let him. He can't grab you with the hands. He can't stomp you down. He can't drag you. The only thing he can do is put thoughts in your mind. So a man thinketh, so is he. And the devil wants to penetrate your mind. He wants to make you mad. He wants to make you grouchy. He wants to squash your attitude. You say, devil, boo! Send him back to the pits of hell where he belongs. Glory to God. Because what? Because we got the power. God gave us the power to do that as a Christian. People do and say because you have God on your side and the Lord in your heart. Someone say praise the Lord. Third thing, Jonah became a runaway because he felt that God, and this is something so many people think, he thought, well, God will get somebody else if I don't go. God will get somebody else to do it. I'll just run down Tarsus and have me a nap on the way. God will pick somebody else because I'm, I'm about going there. My, my, my. He said, the Lord will get someone else and that will be no longer my responsibility. He got in the ship, he ran away. A lot of people feel that way. If they don't obey God, somebody else will do it. The Bible says that the gifts and calling of God, of God are without repentance. Are you getting this message? I say, or without recall, to make you understand. If the call of God comes to you, that call is never recalled in eternity. Are you getting this message? All right, glory to God, hallelujah. Or without recall, if, you, if, if, if he's there, when the Spirit of God comes to you, and you have an urge to do something for the Lord, that urge stays with you night and day. And I believe that we have to obey, obey it. If we shrug it off, shrug our shoulders and say, well, God will get somebody else. If he didn't want you, he wouldn't have tapped you on the shoulder to start with. Come on, church. If God did not have a special work for you to do, he wouldn't have put the impression in your mind or the urge in your heart. God called me, Pastor Dennison, to be here this morning preaching to you. God called me. There could have been others up here better than I am. They could, I could have said, well, Lord, send somebody else better than I am. Glory to God, hallelujah, hallelujah. But you know what? He didn't call somebody else. He called me, Pastor Denison. I must obey. Someone say praise the Lord. Glory to God, hallelujah. I think that we must obey God. I think we must walk with him. See, we cannot get somebody else to do our job when God has called us to do it. Jonah ran away because he thought God would get somebody. The fourth thing he ran away because he thought he could. A lot of people think they can run away from God. How? Hmm. I wonder where a man would go to get away from God. Jonah got in a boat, went down the bottom of it and fell asleep. <coughs> he he thought he could run away and he didn't reckon with the arms that moved the stars about or nor the, nor the hands that scooped out the depths of the ocean and flung the stars from their fingertips and hung the earth on nothing. <coughs> God began to breathe up on the sea. He began, he began to breathe up on the sea. He released the winds of the earth and they blew across the waters. The waters turned into the, it became, became a, a furry, a, a boisterous storm. The boat began to pop. The sails were ripped from their poles. The little ship began to wallow around like a monster in distress. Come on, church. The sailors screamed, we're going to perish. Throw off the wire. Get rid of everything on here. They, they began to lighten the ship, and praise God, by throwing the stuff off. But the wind blew. The thunder rolled. The lightning flashed. The waves broke over the decks. Jonah was in the bottom of sleep. Uh-huh. What happens to a person who runs away? I know 
where you where you right where you are right now, if you're running away from God, I can tell you where you're at. You're in a storm. If you're running away from God right now, you're in a storm. You're asleep in, in that storm. If you're running, if you're not obeying God, if you're not doing what he, what God wants you to do, you know the Lord wants you to, to do in this world, then you're in the middle of a storm. You're in danger. The sailors woke Jonah and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise up on thy, arise up on thy God that we perish not. In, uh, in verse 6. Jonah woke up. He staggered to the deck. He looked around. He saw the storm. He said, boys. <laughs> boys. Come on. Throw me overboard. That's what he said. Throw me overboard and this storm will stop. They said, boy, where are you from? Hey, man, where are you from? What's your country? Why, why are you here? They began to question him. He said, men, I'm a Hebrew. God called me to Nineveh, and I'm going to Tarshish. I'm running. I'm running from God, and that's why this storm is here. Throw me overboard, and there will be a calm. Amen. Throw me overboard, and then there will be a calm. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're, you're going to have to get off of that vehicle that's taking you away from God. You're going to have to get away from that vehicle, whatever vehicle you're on, wherever you're going, it's taking you away from God. And you don't have to ask me if it's taking you away. You know where it's taking you away or not. Come on, church. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So you've got to get off of that vehicle and get on the one that's going for God. Can someone say praise the Lord? And uh, that was certainly straighten you out in the midst of your storm. Glory to God. God had to, what happened? Glory to God. He, he throwed it, they threw him overboard. He, uh, when he went down into that fish, when he went into it, and uh, after he got thrown overboard, Jonah said, that's what many of the people should say, throw me overboard. They picked up Jonah. They shoved him out into the water. I believe he hit with a splash, don't you? But he wasn't in the water five seconds. And God had prepared a great big fish. The fish was just the right size to swallow Jonah, and, and he gulped him down. I don't believe he even had any mustard. He says, come now and follow me. Come as you are and follow me. Whenever I got saved, that pastor came up. My wife got saved. <laughs> I'm out there. I, I was I a was sinner. But I was under conviction because I was going out before she did. I was going out to those churches. I wouldn't go in. I'd go up to the steps, look in, go up to the door. I'd go back home. Remind me of that song a while ago. I'd go back home, yeah. I was under conviction. My wife wasn't under conviction. She wouldn't go out with me. I tried to get her to go out. Okay, let's go. And, and so I went out and looked at the churches, but we didn't go in. One time this guy come, he was a Christian, and I knew him. And uh, Bill Burrett was his name. He's going on to be with the Lord now. He hadn't been saved that long. But he kept coming to my house. He said, come on. I want you to go to this revival. He knew how well I liked steak. He said, I'll buy you a steak dinner if you'll just come this one night. Well, the only way I'm going to get him off my back is to go. My wife, she was listening all the time. But he didn't invite her out for no steak dinner. He invited me. She didn't even get one. But I went out to church with him for that revival. And my wife went with me. She stood out there on that step on that parking lot and smoked about three cigarettes. And she puffed one right after the other boy. She didn't want to go in. 
Whenever we did go in, we sat about halfway back in that church. It was packed out with a evangelist from Delaware. It was packed out. I'm looking around, glory to God, hallelujah. Some of the people I knew in there, some from coming out of the, the place of the world where I was in, my wife was in, we knew a few of them. Anyway, we're back there, and he, this evangelist, he called, makes the altar call. He says, if there's anybody here that wants to receive the Lord as their Savior and they haven't done it yet, raise your hands. I'm telling you, my wife had no intention of raising her hands, but it went up, and she had a sweater on her hand, and the sweater flew over there. Her hand went up. All them people with hands up all over that church. He, this affair just came out straight up to where my wife was. And I'm standing there next to her. And I'm trying to get down, crouching down, trying to get underneath the pew out of the way. <laughs> he comes up to her and he said, God sent me to you. If you don't believe it, look, and I come to pastor. God sent me to you. And he, my wife followed him <laughs> back to the, to the altar. And the pastor got a hold of me and he says, come on over here. And I said, well, I said, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. You know, the devil tells you that. He tells you you're not good enough. You got to get everything cleaned up before you get saved. That's what the devil tells you. You don't mind me talking a little bit, do you? I don't know why I'm giving this testimony, but God knows. Anyway, that evangelist took his hand and he put it like that on top of my wife's head. His fingers right on her head. I'm telling you, my wife could tell you back there if she wanted to, but far fell from heaven. Far fell from heaven. She felt those fingers going down right through the top of her head. She felt it, glory to God, hallelujah. She got delivered from that nicotine demon. Praise the Lord. She saw him go out of her. Praise and she smelled of that thing. It stuck, she said. She said it stuck. Come out of her. She can't even stand to be close to anybody smoking anymore. And that's been years and she still can't stand it. As much as she was addicted, as much as she was, she couldn't even stand for me to hold a lighter. But she's never wanted or could stand to be near anybody smoking since that very day. God touched her and she felt that burning inside of her. She had to go to the hospital. She had to have something done. Both of her feet operated on and uh, that, that, that burning went right with her. She felt the power of God through it. It was, it was just, it's just a miracle. What happened to me? I said, I'm not ready yet. I said, I'm not ready yet. The devil tells you you're not ready yet. Come on, church. It tells you, well, I'll give up. I'm going to use cigarette. I'll give up cigarettes when God's ready. He's ready now. Anyway, I went home that night and I went under conviction. I went into the bedroom and I knelt down at the bed and I asked God to forgive me. I invited him into my life. And I went that, that was on a Sunday. That Wednesday I went to another church and as soon as they had an altar call, I felt, you know how the devil says, you're not saved. So I went to the, went to the altar call and said the sinner's prayer again. That was on a Wednesday. 
Sunday rolled around. The devil still accusing me I wasn't saved. I went back to the church where she was at, where we went that first time. I went back up again and told the pastor, I said, told him what I did. And he, and he said it to send his prayer again with me again. And then as I got more mature in the Lord, I realized when I said it at the bed, I was saved right then and there. Amen. Right then and there. And the devil kept on trying to accuse me that it wasn't. Don't you let that devil accuse you. When you accept the Lord, you accept him and you hold on to it. Don't you let go. And getting back to the cigarettes now, I want to hit that a little bit more because then I didn't give mine up right away. But it wasn't long after that I got rid of mine too. And we took our cigarettes and we put them in a bag and I took them to where I worked at. I took them to where I worked at and gave them to someone out there, one of my co-workers. And it wouldn't, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. I got convicted. I took my sin and gave it to him. I took my sin and gave it to him. You don't do that, church. You don't do that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I gave him my sin. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know better. I'd like to say something else while I'm on that subject. I hadn't got saved too long then until and I, I took a fifth of whiskey and I put it underneath the seat of my, my truck. I put it underneath the seat of my truck. Went, well, you know, this is medicinal purposes, Lord. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't long till my wife and I got in an argument about something. We got in an argument. Right away the devil jumped on me. And I got out that door and right up that path I went to the truck and got underneath that seat and got that fifth of whiskey and come right down that path with it. <laughs> went in the door. <laughs> I walked in the house with that bottle of whiskey and Linda, my daughter, got that bottle out of my hand and run in there and poured it down the sink and threw the bottle down the trash can. Good for her. <laughs> and if she hadn't have done that and I had have drank that whiskey, I would probably wouldn't be up here preaching to you right now. I would have backslid and maybe never went back to the Lord. It's dangerous. It's dangerous to mess around with the devil and his instruments. It's dangerous to mess around with that stuff. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Bury it. And don't dig it back up no more. Come on here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Yes, ma'am. That was only about two months after I got saved. I hadn't really got sanctified. But the old devil got a hold of me. He rose that temper up. You know what you do with that? You're supposed to take, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to control your temper. Don't let your temper control you. That's, that's, that's part of the fruits of being a, a, a Christian. Come on, church. Temperance. <laughs> Yeah. 
by faith You reach out to Him He'll meet your every need Oh, He, he will respond to the cross you have a need, whatever it is, whether it be a spiritual need, a mental or even physical need, God is still on the throne. So wherever you are, I want you to just take a stand of faith right now and be healed in Jesus' name. Rise down.